Uh, the Lord put on my heart spiritual warfare. Go to Ephesians chapter 6. Now this is a very important subject. I don't really all often preach about it, although in a way I do. But I did write two books about it. My first book was about spiritual warfare. And I wrote that in 1994. And it still gets some circulation. And then my latest book was about spiritual warfare. As we find ourselves in a battle, whether people know it or not, we're in a battle. Look, look at how Paul describes it, Ephesians chapter 6. He says, finally, verse 10, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. What God wants us to be is strong in him. Sometimes the only way to be strong in the Lord is to be weak in the world, weak in the flesh. I actually think the Lord did us a favor shutting down all these entertainments and everything like that. Because he really has given us a chance to get down with him. And when this goes, and it might or might not, then we'll want to know we did everything we could while that was there. Be strong in the Lord in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God. that You may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. So the devil has wiles, stratagems. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. So he tells us there's a, a demonic hierarchy that controls the whole world. I mean, it's really important to have a Christian worldview about what's actually going on in this world. And not a simplistic view, but the one the, informed by the Bible itself. The, the devil is called the god of this age. He won't be for long, but he's god of this age. The world, the Bible says, the whole world lies in the wicked one. That's why we're never surprised by this, the outrages we see all, all the time by our so-called leaders. The whole world lies in the power of the wicked one. The devil is setting up a kingdom which is an, a counterfeit of the real kingdom. Now, we're looking for a kingdom. Jesus Christ promises a kingdom, and we are all partakers of that kingdom. And we pray with all saints of all times and all, all down through the last 2,000 years, let thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I'm looking for the rule of God on this world. But that's coming, and this is today. Satan has a fake kingdom, a hierarchy. Principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness of this age. Spiritual wickedness in high places. Now look, um, Daniel gave us a little peep of it. I won't have you turn there, but uh, Daniel is praying for an answer in Babylon, which is pagan kingdom that he was sent to as a basically as a captive of war. And he, he was, uh, they tried to retrain him in everything to turn him into a Babylonian, but he just wouldn't have it. You don't have to become a Babylonian, but you must steal yourself, especially the children, not to become a Babylonian. Because Babylon likes to change names and teach new things and give you food that you never had before. You don't have to be a Babylonian. That's part of our spiritual warfare. Daniel wouldn't be a Babylonian, neither would Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. A lot of other Jews became Babylonians. Because it's not a matter of genetics, it's a matter of affinity in the heart. He resisted. And one day he's praying and he's saying, Lord, I need to know the answer of the future of my people. And he went on a fast for the answer. And he fasted for 21 days. And then finally, no one less than the angel Gabriel came to him and said, I, I took off from heaven the day you prayed. Oh, then what took you 21 days? The prince of the power of Persia withstood me. You mean the prince of the Persia, which is Iran? Yes, it turns out that all pagan nations have patron demons that control things there to the extent that God allows. He says, I'm going to go back. I'm going to have to fight my way back. Michael helped me. That's the one patron that is valid. Israel has a patron angel named Michael. And then he said, the prince of Grecia will come. And I think this is so interesting. Lo and behold, world history reflected what Daniel saw in the spirit. The Persians were overthrown. They overthrew the Babylonians. And then the Grecians overthrew the Persians against all 
accountability. What happened on earth is only a reflection of what happened in the heavenlies. There is a spiritual war for the souls of men. And Satan, is, his thing is uh, individual and corporate. His, his corporate thing is to set up his own kingdom and to have an alternative kingdom to the kingdom of God to attract men away from God and to estrange men from God. That's what Satan does and that's what Satan's doing very powerfully. His kingdom is based on lies. One of the premises of it is love of self. But see, the thing is, it's, it's temporary. It's already doomed. When Jesus was on his way to the cross, he said something so deep and profound. I'm sure hardly anyone understood what he was saying. Now is the, the judgment of this world. Now is the prince of this world cast down. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. Jesus is literally saying, Satan's been defeated since the cross. It's like uh, Hitler was defeated since D-Day. The war lasted another year. And there was the Battle of the Bulge and all that big, big, big last push. But really the war was already over once they successfully landed on Normandy. Satan is a defeated foe already. He's already been judged. The sentence has already been passed. But that doesn't mean that we don't have a spiritual war. We are engaged in a spiritual war. The kingdom of Satan is humanistic. J Jesus rebuked Peter one time because he was telling the disciples, I'm going to the cross. That's what's going to have to happen. This is what it's going to take for me to save the men, the souls of men. I'm going to the cross. I'm going to be spit on. I'm going to be humiliated. I'm going to be weakened. I'm going to be crucified. And Peter is speaking like a normal human being. Don't, please don't do that, Lord. Pity yourself. It couldn't be. And Jesus' answer is very instructive. Get behind me, Satan. How would you like to be called Satan by Jesus? Satan, you're speaking through Peter right now. And then he said, because you don't savor the things that be of God but the things that be of men. He didn't say the things that be of Satan. So in a sense, Satan is not a Satanist. Satan is a humanist. Now, if Satan was a Satanist, it'd be a lot easier because you could tell obvious e evil for what it is. And I'm sure a lot of the leaders of, of the modern world are Satanists. But because Satan's a humanist, it's a lot more subtle. I was raised my whole life thinking humanism and humanities, that's all good. But what is it but the exaltation of man into deity? It's the serpent's lie. You shall be as God. He says, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, against principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Well, we're seeing that. It's coming out in the open now. The highest places in politics and government and education and culture and science and everything. Every single institution is increasingly being revealed as antichrist. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. So in the armor of God, it's not a matter of taking ground. It's a matter of holding ground. Jesus bought us with his blood. He brought us into the family of God. He set us as his witnesses. He gave us a truth that we are to be the custodians of in this world. Now the spiritual warfare is to plant yourself in ranks like the Roman army, link your shields and withstand is what the word literally says. Withstand, especially in the evil day, in the day when truth is being eclipsed, denied, counterfeited, lied about, we are to stand for what is true and good and right and what we've, we've been shown, right? It's really simple. I want to demythologize it. It's very, very, very simple. We are witnesses. This is the day of the lie. We are to hold fast 
Withstand every attempt by Satan to st steal and rob the truth. And I, look, it's crazy, but churches right and left are just getting rid of truth. Oh, you don't have to always go by the Bible. Oh, yeah, gay marriage is just as good as straight marriage. Oh, yeah, you know, I could give you the list where they're just pitching it out right and left. You wouldn't even think it would happen. But here it is happening right before our eyes. Part of the problem is they, they left, left off the armor of God. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with the truth. Your loins is your waist and uh, groin area and... Uh, in the ancient world, if you normally, normal clothes are like long flowing stoles and robes and things like that. And it, you wouldn't want to get in a fight when you're all in a robe like that because you could get all tangled up. So basically what they do, and you can see this in the Bible over and over again, gird up your loins. What's that mean? Wrap those loose hanging robes or stole or whatever you're wearing into a belt, a girdle, and tighten it up. Now, how do we apply that? You got emotions, all kinds, and you got to put them underneath something that's a lot less free-flowing that won't likely trip you up. The truth, it's called the belt of truth. And I was taught a saying early in my Christian life. Now, uh, it was pretty good, even though a lot of other things that people taught well, it wasn't so good. But this was a good one. He says, I am not moved by what I see, and I'm not moved by what I feel, but I'm going to be moved by what I believe, and I believe the Word of God. I'm not going to give way to my feelings. I'm not going to let my emotions take me to the right or the left. I'm not going to get mad at someone and hate them when I know Jesus tells me to forgive them. I'm not going to follow my own lust down some rabbit path into perdition. I'm going to put everything under the truth. It's just like Jesus in the wilderness. Satan saying, basically, what, what are you doing out, out here? Why, if you're the son of God, why would God put you in this position? Now, there's a lot of people asking that question all the time. If I'm really of God, why has God got me in this position? And Jesus would ha wouldn't have any of it. But he didn't tell Satan what he felt at the time. That might not have been too good, really. He's a human. He said, it is written in his resistance to Satan. It is written. Because the word of God is the sword of the spirit. The truth of God is the belt that takes all that tangled mess that we trip over half the time in battle. You got something to tuck it into. You're not stuck just with yourself and your feelings. You got the Bible. You got the promises of God. You got the truths of God. A man struggles with lust. He, he would do well just saying something like, Thou shalt not commit adultery. There's more authority and power in that than any New Year's resolution you would ever make. Okay. The word is powerful, right? Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Oh, slap me in the face. I can't hate that person. I don't care what they did to me. I got to love them. I'm, I, I don't have a choice in the matter. That's tucking your loin cloths into the truth so you don't trip in the battle. You ever see the Roman legions? Man, they all look the same. You see them, like the people they fought, some of the barbarians, I mean, everyone looked different. Everyone's unique. It's all self-expression, and they're all wearing all this kind of crazy stuff. Some are not even wearing anything. Some are wearing these loose robes and everything. The Romans have won almost every time. Why? Uniformity, discipline. They wore these girdles that they tucked everything else into. And he says, having uh, put on the breastplate of righteousness. Well, you want to have a breastplate. You've seen those things. If I had a breastplate right now, it would look like I had a six pack. All right. Uh, what is it? It's a hard thing to protect your most vulnerable organs. Because if an arrow hits your liver or your heart, you're in trouble. But God has given the Christian warriors 
a breastplate. It's called righteousness. Now let me make this simple for the first lesson on spiritual warfare today. Righteousness means two things, and in this case, the breastplate is composed of both of them. Righteousness is being in the right. Listen, you can't win this battle if you have a bad conscience. If you know that you're doing wrong, you could, if you just know you're doing wrong, you're going to be vulnerable. The, the whole thing with Satan, as we'll explain, is starts in the mental area. The devil messes with our mind, and the devil has 6,000 years to study us. And by the way, when you read Genesis 3, the devil was brilliant the way he handled the first couple. I mean, there was nobody more qualified to face temptation than them, other than Jesus. And the devil just, I mean, completely manipulated them. I think it's a very important study. There's a reason that story is in the Bible, because everyone relives it at some point or other in their life, or maybe over and over and over again. The devil comes like a flood out of the blue, and he doesn't come out really boldly all out. Instead, he just calls things into question. You know, I'm not saying that it's in the Bible, and I'm not saying it's not in the Bible, but are you sure that's in the Bible? <laughs> this is working. This works. Okay. The devil acts ignorant to the woman. And therefore it appeals to her vanity and pride that she gets the chance to instruct him to set the, the record straight. And then uh, he uses, when he talks about God, there's two ways you could talk about God in the first three chapters of the Bible. You could say, Yahweh or Elohim, or you could combine them, Yahweh, Elohim. Genesis chapter 1 is Elohim. Genesis chapter 2 is Yahweh, Elohim. Oh, what's the difference? Well, Yahweh is a personal name. So he's a person. He's close. He's real. Elohim is more like our word God a little bit more remote. It's like the difference between the word God and Jesus. It gives the impression of remote, all-powerful, unknowable, a little bit further. So when Satan comes to the woman, he uses Elohim to give her the feeling of remoteness. You see how subtle this is? And then he inserts a blasphemous thought when he sensed that she was ready. He says, God knows that there's something good for you. He just won't give it to you. Now that's blasphemy, you understand? That is blasphemy to impugn the character of God. Now, all she ever knew about God is that he called her into existence and everything she had ever received from God was good. <laughs> Absolutely good. It was great. And yet he inj injects this blasphemous thought as soon as he works, works some doubt in her. And she doesn't really recoil over it. It's not, it's not unthinkable to her anymore. Whereas it should be, if it wasn't for his previous work. What I want you to, to alert you to is that, look, this is, this is being played out in our lives. When we're alone, or when we're harried, or when we're disappointed, or when we're discouraged, or when we're depressed, or just in the culture. This constant attack. What Paul called it in Ephesians, which we'll, we'll finish this passage, fiery darts. Darts are arrows, fiery darts, they set fires. Satan wants to set a fire in your soul, in your mind. It might just start with a, a spark, but he's hoping for the wind to blow just right to get it to a flame to consume you. And so uh, he tells her that if her eyes would be open, well, that's flattering. 
who wants to go through life with closed eyes so her eyes are going to be open and that she would be like God knowing good and evil now I know I've repeated this before but I think it's one of the fundamental truths of the whole Bible what does that mean to be like God and to know good and evil well technically what it means is that God and his holy word determines what's good and evil, right? Now the best policy is just take his word for it. Amen. Worst thing you could do is insist on finding out by experience. See, this is the spiritual warfare. God says what's good and evil, and if you love God and trust God and take him by the hand through the dark places, he will lead you out. It won't always be dark. It won't always be gloomy. It won't even be murky. All will become clear if you just trust God. But if you ever allow yourself to be seduced and intoxicated by the serpent's lies. And by the way, half, half the battle is just recognizing that there is a serpent, and he does lie, and he's invisible. Thank God he is. I wouldn't want to see him. Anyway, so he insinuates a blasphemous thought into her mind that somehow or other God is harsh and capricious and holding back something that's really good, and she entertained it. It's not unthinkable to her anymore. It's not inconceivable. It would have been, but not now. So she began to doubt, and the serpent knew it. She just starts to doubt. See? The flaming arrow. The fire is starting, see? So, uh, you know, couldn't she see if, on a little reflection that, you know... The opening of uh, God knows that what will happen if your eyes are open. That's true. But God knows a lot more than that. <laughs> this is where people are so willful and stubborn. People are being set up. Believe me, the pride and everything that this culture inculcates and the education system and everything. They think they know everything. OK, she. OK, God does know what will happen if your eyes are open. And God knows a lot more than that. But. The serpent just wants you to focus on that one little thing. So couldn't she realize that he knows a lot more than that? That maybe this opening of the eyes would not add to her happiness at all. It might even lead her into misery that she never even knew existed. It could be harmful and destructive. She's not thinking that at all. You know why? See, this is another thing. Maybe I'm not even doing a good job of communicating, but look, this is happens. This happens all the time, and this is how the devil works. Uh, that she's intoxicated by this vision that's presented to her by the serpent. If you could just be independent of God and just decide for yourself what's right and wrong. Come on, let's grow up. Are we going to be little children, take God by the hand and follow him? I'm going to set you free. I'm going to make you grow up. Okay. That's, that's why one of the serpent's names is Lucifer. What's Lucifer mean? Light bearer. He gives you the light. Wait, I thought God gave me the light. Lo and behold, there's two lights. I thought God gave me the word. Guess what? There's an alternative word. And you got to choose. You choose. And I'll choose. And we all must choose. There's actually a, a doctrine there's uh, among the New Agers and everything called the Luciferian Doctrine that says, you know, Satan was just trying to set us free. God's got us in bondage. We're just too stupid to realize it. Satan wants to set us free. There's actually people who believe that, especially at the top of our societies. They're Luciferians. They actually believe that. That Satan is the light. Well, he's the false light. And Eve could not see that, so she walked in that light. 
We just sang a great song this morning, one of my favorite. Now, I'm all off my notes. I, I just don't even know what I was saying. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. Now, that is one of the most beautiful verses in the whole Bible. Really beautiful. If we, the one indispensable condition for fellowship with God for us sinners. There's only one. Come into the light. Now, <laughs> the light, the true light, is the light of exposure. See, we, do, we don't have to be perfect to fellowship with God. How many are glad of that? When it says walk in the light, it couldn't mean walk in some kind of holy perfection because he goes on to say the blood of Jesus Christ will cleanse you from each and every sin. So he couldn't possibly be saying there's some elite class of Christians, they're in the light, everyone else is in the dark. No, all light means is the willingness to come out where you are known for what you are. Nothing more, nothing less, no pretense. That's the light. And as we've, we've all done it, that's what baptism is. We, we set up our baptisms in a way where it's you come into the light. You say, hey, I'm a sinner, but I need Jesus. And that's light, and you stay in that light. Some people run off from the church just when it was getting good. They said, I like that church back when I felt comfortable every single week. And everyone made me feel like the center of the world and they remembered my birthday. But I don't like it now. It's getting uncomfortable. Wait a minute. You're just getting to that place where God wanted you. <laughs> to stay right there. In the light. Now guess what? This has everything to do with spiritual warfare. Now, Satan is a false light. Christ is the light of the world. Satan is Lucifer. Christ is the bright and morning star. You know what Isaiah says Satan is? Son of the morning. Like everything Christ is, Satan sets himself up as a counterfeit. He's miserable, but he is a counterfeit. Isaiah says that the Messiah is the branch of the Lord. Isaiah's talking to Lucifer in the name of God says, you will be cast down, you miserable branch. Wait, what branch? There's two branches? There's two lights? There's two words? There's two kingdoms? <laughs> There's even two churches. That's how tr tricky it is. That's what the spiritual warfare is. That if we will be true to God and his word, then he will lead us through this dark wilderness. And we shall not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. There's a beautiful verse that says, um, um, you have already overcome them, little children, for greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And if you look at the verse, that's 1 John 4.4. 4. That's another one I really like. 1 John 4.4, 4, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. You've already overcome them. Well, we've overcome who? Well, earlier in the chapter, he's talking about antichrists. We've overcome the antichrist already. Look, many years ago, after I first became a Christian, someone gave me a bunch of cassette tapes. Now, I notice there's young people here. There's this relic from the ancient world called cassette tapes. They're little plastic scrolls that the ancients once learned by. And you know, to make a long story short, Copeland and Hagen is who I was listening to. They were antichrists. Because anti doesn't just mean against Christ, it's instead of Christ. So Satan has raised these people up. Because this is the spiritual warfare, always an alternative word, an alternative teaching, an alternative church, an alternative Bible, an alternative spirit. Okay. And thank God I saw through it. I've told you the story so many times, but I, by God's grace, he showed me and my wife that we were involved in something very bad. We renounced it all and we confessed where we were wrong. It didn't happen overnight. It took about five years. 
church grew from about 80 to about 10. It was incredible, incredible church growth. But anyway, it's worth it. I'd rather go with truth than with the crowd. There's a beautiful verse. All of my verses today are beautiful. Exodus 23, thou shalt not follow the multitude to do evil. That's another one of Satan's uh, wiles is, hey, you, what, what's wrong with you? No, not, everyone's not going that way. You're going the wrong way. Most people are going that way. That's the way you ought to go. Well, you should not follow multitude to do evil. Anyway, um, so let me, let me share some other verses. Okay. You have already overcome them. How do you overcome Antichrist? See through it and humble yourself back to the word of God and renounce all your associations with the false teachers and the false prophets and be ruthless about it. Not everyone does that. Some people stick with it because they have a misguided loyalty. Oh, those are great people, and even though they may be a little off, they have so much good to say. This is exactly what Satan wants. Now, this is getting worse because we are toward the very end time, and there's a scripture that literally says, the devil has been cast down from heaven and knows that he has just a little bit of time left, therefore he's enraged. And he is, of course. That's what you see with the leaders of the world. That's what you see with this stupid lockdown. Now, if you remember when it started, I wanted to give the benefit of the doubt to the governor of the state of Iowa. But when you see governor after governor after governor allowing Walmart, Kmart, and whatever else, but no church, one governor even said, and if you do have church with 10 people, no songs, no prayers, no Bibles. This is one of the problems with Satan. He always goes too far. It soon becomes obvious what they want. I mean, they've got to be so happy that just with a little bit of fearful thing of a dubious plague, churches all over the country shut down. That was too easy. Look, this is the devil. The devil. Now another scripture says they overcame the devil. Well, we have to overcome the spirit of Antichrist, right? And we have to overcome the devil. How did they overcome the devil? They overcame him by the blood of the lamb. Well, we didn't have to do that, did we? Jesus shed his blood. How does the blood of Jesus help us overcome the devil? It takes us from his side back to God's side. See, before I met Jesus, I was on the devil's side. I just didn't know it. I thought I was a good Catholic boy, just going minding my own business, trying to do as good as I can, and not really doing too good at all, really. But when Jesus shed his blood and purchased me, one of the things that that purchase accomplished is, and found in Colossians 1, he has delivered us from the power of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of the son of his love. And I became a new citizen of a new kingdom and a partaker of a new creation. This is another, another one of my favorites. If any man be in Christ, a new creation. It says literally, behold, a new creation. God isn't just going to save souls. He's going to save everything. He's going to renew everything. Everything is going to be made new. Praise God. And we, now here's the thing. Now in the Bible, there's two ages. That's the conception of human history. Two ages. This age and the age to come. Jesus called it the regeneration, the renewal of all things. Paul said to encourage us in Romans 8, the sufferings of this present life aren't even worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be. The age to come is coming on us, but we're in the overlap. It's not going to fully dawn until Israel admits their sin. That's why Satan is literally going to try and wipe out Israel right before our eyes. Because he wants to block the age to come. Now this age that belongs to today, thank God, is passing. It's the age of decay, the age of death, the age of Adam, the age of things that are just passing away. There's only one good thing about this age. He gave us a way of salvation in it. He gave us a way to be born again. And what happens when you're born again? You get translated from this age to the age to come. Now all who are of this age are passing. All of them. I don't care who they are, how rich they are, how supposedly good they are. 
all is doomed and passing. This age is going. All who are of the age to come, like he told us at one point, and we exercise it right this morning with the laying on of hands, the church has the powers of the age to come. In the age to come, there won't be any sickness. There won't be any disease. The crippled will leap like a harp. The son of righteousness will rise with healing in his wings. People are going to skip about like a new calf and can barely make it down the stairs. It's going to be fantastic. And in this little forgotten, despised group of people, and hundreds like it all over, thousands like it, or hundreds of thousands like it all over the world, God has given us a deposit of the powers of the age to come. It's fantastic, right? A beautiful story in the Bible about the resurrection of Lazarus. That he's dead and buried and embalmed and wrapped up and four days pass before Jesus gets to him. And they go, Lord, if you'd have been here, my brother would have lived. And that's when he gave this great quote, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, they'll never perish. Praise God, there is no death for us, right? She sleeps only to be woken by the sound of the trumpet. But you know, Jesus says, move away the stone. And they did, they moved away the stone even though they thought he, it, the body would stink. And Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth. Next thing you know, he's standing there in the tomb. And I always like to think of this, because what a picture it is of reality. It did happen. It's history. That happened. But it's also a picture of reality. For the man who heard the voice of Jesus is literally standing between two worlds entirely. Behind him, the world of death, mourning, decay, sorrow, and the wages of sin. The stench, and as Jeremiah says, the dust of death settles everywhere. Right outside that door, sunlight, flowers, people, life, love, food, fellowship. But where is he? Right, right there. Where are we? We're right there between two ages. Now let me get back to the unfortunate subject of spiritual warfare. So, uh, you know, Eve couldn't think straight. Let me tell you something the Lord has been speaking to me lately. Sin doesn't let you think straight. You can't think straight. I heard a guy give a speech, and he happened to be a Catholic, but you know, he, he was right. Even the broken clock's right twice a day. And he was saying about some politician, oh, that's a, that lady's a lesbian and she can't think straight. And it really got me thinking, you know, you're right. Your, your life is disordered. And to the extent that it's disordered, you cannot entertain logos, reason, rationality, and he was talking about a policy, a very vindicative and petty policy she wanted to enact against churches, it, using this um, lockdown to do so. I can't remember what it was. But he was right. I mean, it, it, you talk about the epitome and the opposite of political correctness, which is another way, a form of distorted thinking. And people would be shocked. And the man wasn't trying to be bold about it either. He's just matter of fact. And that's true. As a matter of fact, if you're perverse, you can't think right. I've met non-Christians that had clear thoughts. I do not deny that. Every man bears the image of God. But to the extent that you're perverted, you cannot think rationally you lose that capacity and that's what satan satan had eve just totally intoxicated with a vision of being like a god being independent of god and she couldn't think right because her reason was perverted by wrong desire and by ambition I mean, even the devil himself up in heaven, you can't find a more place full of more light. Up in heaven himself. 
Who does he, how do you think you're going to overthrow God? But he, he's intoxicated by a false vision. And he's not thinking right. I will be like the most high God. How many most highs can you have? You can only have one. I will exalt myself. You see how vainglory and ambition destroys the thinking? That's part of the problem with this evil generation. They have been taught that self-esteem is the end and the goal of all education. These poor kids, some of them go to schools, couldn't add or read, but they are awesome on self-esteem. I will set my throne above the stars of God. Those are the fellow angels. I will sit on the sides of the north. Wait, that's where the temple is? You're going to be in the place of the temple? I will be like the most high God. Will you be exalted to heaven? And God says, no, you will be sent to hell. You will be sent to hell. And then there's another aspect of spiritual warfare. Now, we're going to get it more into detail in the weeks ahead, but it all, it's all there in Genesis 3. You know, it's just so plain as a day. Uh, one of the things that comes out, and a lot, of a lot of times we don't think about this stuff, right? This reckless and insatiable desire of the fallen people to involve everybody else in their own ruin, their own miserable ruin. Now, we're seeing this now. Okay, here's what's going to probably happen, and here's what's already happening. Okay, so supposedly through fetal tissue research, these amazing scientific miracles are coming forward, and these are incredible healings. And, you know, they're so incredible and amazing that a lot of people don't think about at what cost? Like, would you, if you were blind, would you want your sight back if it cost a little baby their life? Just kill that baby and you get your sight back. You talk about Satan's bargain. How about if you're pro-life and you're adamantly pro-life and you believe in pro-life, pro-life all the way, and then the vaccine comes and you're so scared of COVID that you take the vaccine even if it's made of baby parts. It's Genesis 3 all over again. The woman took the fruit, gave to her husband with her. Why? Misery wants company. There's a horrifying scripture in Proverbs. Though hand join in hand, the wicked will not go unpunished. And then I got one more thing to share. And that is that basically our spiritual warfare has to do with the polarization of the human race. And this is in Genesis also, because if you remember the original gospel, it says something like this, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between her seed and your seed. Now he will crush your head and you shall bruise his heel. That's the original gospel. And Adam and Eve were still sophisticated enough to understand it. Now, I might not have understood it. I've been reading the Bible for 40 years and finally coming to some kind of an understanding of that. But they got it because they were just freshly fallen and still quite sophisticated and clear. And they got it instantly. I'll put enmity between you and the woman and your seed and her seed. And he will crush your head, Satan. But you will bruise his heel. And into the gloom comes a ray of light. Wow. Awesome. The, wom the woman is going to have a baby. And as a matter of fact, technically, a virgin baby. The answer is going to come through that baby. Because that baby's destiny is to rise up and crush the serpent's head. The primal curse shall be reversed in that baby. And the work and effect and kingdom of the serpent will come crashing down with the, with the birth of that child. Now that explains a lot of the Old Testament. That's why you see Satan always trying to take out children. Because he knew that promise. And... The serpent would have a seed, and 
the woman would have a seed, which is an impossibility. So it's got to be a virgin born child. Now, if the woman's seed is Jesus, the Messiah, who's the serpent's seed? Well, that would be the Antichrist. He hasn't come yet. Okay. And no, Satan can't have babies. Any more than a woman can have a baby without a child. But there will be someone come along that has total and complete and absolute affinity with the serpent in all of his goals. He'll be the serpent's man. I don't believe he's very far away. And by the way, there's about 15 really good candidates right now. But there is a secondary meaning to this verse. Because this verse is a prediction of the whole course of human history. And this has everything to do with our spiritual warfare. It's not just me and you and Satan and the angels and the demons and everything. It involves everybody. For there is a corporate understanding. The woman will have one seed of a woman is Jesus Christ. Born of a woman. Born of the Virgin Mary, right? But there will be a congregation that is also referred to as the seed of the woman. And humanity will be divided into two congregations because there will be another congregation that refers to, is referred to by God as the seed of the serpent. Now, who are the seed of the serpent? I'd like to read a quote that I quoted from my book because it's the best explanation of it I've ever seen. He says, who then are the seed of the serpent? They are all those who manifest that spirit of independent pride by which their father, the devil, fell. They are those who will not acknowledge their own hopeless condition, nor will they submit to be saved by the merits of the Son of God. Anyone know anyone like that? <laughs> but will either themselves do what they think they need to do to save themselves, or else they'll just proudly deny the need of doing anything at all. And they will clamor against God if they have any belief in his existence. You know why? Because he doesn't immediately gratify what they think they need or want or how they want the world to be. You've all heard it. If their God's so good, then you could fill in. And they'll never make reference, none whatsoever, to the fact that they've broken his law. And they are blinded and maddened by self-conceit. They actually believe the serpent's lie, in a sense. That they're gods. That they can decide for themselves. Nor do they ever hesitate, not in the slightest, to defy the will of God. If their own inclination prompts them to do such, such are the serpent's seed, distinguished by the spirit which animates their father, the devil, and their federal head, and doomed at last to share with him the lake of fire. I mean, so think of Governor Cuomo railing against God publicly. Or think of him six months ago. Sta signing a bill in the State House of, of New York, standing up and applauding it like, like they just won a war, calling for babies to be bi born, um, killed right up to birth. <laughs> These are the seed of the serpent. I'm not saying that they can't be saved. Look, I was the seed of the serpent at one time. All of us had that affinity. That's what the new birth translates us out of. That's what the new birth takes us out of. If that's the seed of the serpent, then what would the seed of the woman be? Well, that would be all those who humbly acknowledge that sin demands death. That would be the reliance of the guilty upon the God-appointed substitute. That would be those who endure persecution for the sake of the eternal goal, who hope in the triumph, ultimately, of redemption through the seed of the woman. It would be all those who, like Adam and Eve, after they were tried and indicted and brought before the bar, stood there and let God strip them 
of their fig leaves, their self-righteousness. And then to their horror, they saw the first death and allowed God to clothe them in bloody garments, signifying that the only way to undo the damage that's been done would be the death of a substitute appointed by God. It would be, as we know on the other side of it, the blood of the cross of Jesus Christ. This is how we overcome, by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of our testimony. In other words, we agree with it. And by the renunciation of our own life. I'm a sinner. I don't have anything to be proud of. Anything less than that, the devil gets the victory. Let me pray. Father, we are engaged, and I pray that you'll equip us. Let the full armor of God be realized in our lives. Let us take up that shield of faith and quench the fiery darts. Let us take up the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God praying always. Let us protect our mind with the helmet of the hope of salvation and let our feet be shod with the preparation of the gospel and let our emotions come under control and let us tuck them into the belt of truth. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, God bless you all.